I mean, why is it that when we act peacefully, we get shot, we get beaten, we get spat upon? Dr. Wilderson holds an A.B. from Dartmouth College in European Philosophy and Comparative Government, an M.F.A. in Creative Writing from Columbia University where he was simultaneously enrolled in Edward Said and Jean Franco's Cultural Studies Project. In addition, he holds an M.A. and Ph.D. from the Rhetoric Department at UC Berkeley. While most people in debate are familiar with Dr. Wilderson's work of critical theory, red, white, and black, cinema, and the structure of U.S. antagonisms, there's much less familiarity with his work of creative nonfiction. Frank Wilderson has received numerous writing awards, including the Eisner Prize for Creative Achievement of the Highest Order, the Crothers Short Story Award, the Judas Stronach Award for Poetry, the Jerome Foundation Artists and Writers Award, the Maya Angelou Award for Best Fiction Portraying the Black Experience in America. His fiction and creative prose, as well as his critical and scholarly work have been published internationally. Dr. Wilderson's work deals with the most fundamental questions of theory and politics. What is the status of the subject? What is violence? How do we conceptualize violence? And ultimately, what does it mean to suffer? With that, please welcome Dr. Frank Wilderson. from the late 50s all the way to about 1966, 67, was that the majority of black people in the United States believed in peaceful civil disobedience. In other words, eating in cafeterias where you were not allowed to eat, riding in the front of buses where you're not allowed to ride in the front of buses, and registering to vote when you're not allowed to register to vote. That was the vision of, I would say, young and old, as I moved from age uh, zero in 1956 all the way to about age 10 in 1966. But somewhere around 1966, things began to change. And what we found internal to the Black community was the beginning of two kinds of splits. One was a generational split, where younger people like myself began to feel that it is really dumb to go to a cafeteria, have people spit on you, have people dump all kinds of uh, milkshakes on your head, have people beat you up, and to simply act like Gandhi and uh, not, not resist. In, in other words, what young people began to ask the question was, when are we going to be able to live in this country and make a kind of action that resists unfair treatment and get a comparable response to that action. I mean, why is it that when we act peacefully, we get shot, we get beaten, we get spat upon? The generational split began to be tired of the old folks' patience, the old folks' degree of wanting to um, not retaliate. And we began to think that no, Number one, self-defense is legitimate. We also then began to see people around the world struggling for self-determination. And, and so the younger generation began to think, what the hell? Why do we have to just defend ourselves? This system of capitalism, this system of anti-blackness, uh, this system of all kinds of oppression, which is not just oppressing people in the United States, but going around the world as an imperialist structure, we need to undo this structure. And so these are the kinds of things that really had um, tumultuous effect. From the age of two in 1958 to the age of six in 1962, I lived in what's called a, a multiracial enclosed community on the University of Michigan campus where all these kids that I went to kindergarten and, and nursery school and first grade with were basically the children of professors and graduate students. Then boom, 
My dad graduates with his PhD in 1962. My mom graduates with her MA and six masters in 1962. And boom, we leave this community and we move into this rich white neighborhood in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And all of a sudden, I'm in a completely different world where there have never been any black children at this school before. Most of the problems came from boys calling me the N-word, ambushing me from behind snow banks. I uh, was depressed a lot. From 1967, when I was 11 years old, until 1968, my entire worldview and orientation flip-flop, inverted, changed. I was 11 years old, a very pious, almost Christian, Catholic, monk-like kid. Within 12 months, I became 12 years old. Mao Zedong was very instrumental in my transformation. I read that book. The Panthers were reading that book. It was blowing our mind. The revolution in China in 1949-50 galvanized the imagination of people of color around the world. And so that was a really, that was a galvanizing moment for me. And, Ma, and the Little Red Book was taught to me in the Black Panther office uh, when I became 13 years of age in what they called anti-imperialist after school school. Now, a lot of people thought that, oh, wow, okay, I'm gonna join the Panthers, get a gun and go kill a cop. And they would disabuse you of that sentiment the moment that you walked into the door. The first thing that you had to do was about six weeks of study. They did not give you a gun. They gave you France Fanon's The Wretch of the Earth. They gave you something from Lenin. They gave you Mao Zedong's Little Red Book. They gave you back copies of the Black Panther newspaper and they gave you reading assignments so you had to go away and read them and then you had to come back and talk to them about what you read black kids could go there and even if you didn't want to join and uh be educated in these classrooms and the image that you get of the panthers as crazed cop killing black people is uh, really inadequate they set up free medical care because most black people in, in America are ex extremely impoverished that there's no way to uh, even pay medical pre premiums. J. Edgar Hoover, who ran COINTELPRO and was the head of the FBI, the state police, even said that the Black Panthers are feeding more black children in America than HEW, which is Health, Education, and Welfare. So in other words, what I'm trying to say, there were 10,000 Black Panthers across the country, and they were feeding 10 times that many kids in their free breakfast programs. There was free clothing and shoe uh, programs that they gave to, to, to people. They put up stop signs and began directing traffic where young Black children were being run over by speeding cars and the cities would not put any street lights or stop, or stop signs on. So, so what I'm trying to say is that armed resistance to the state, armed resistance to the police probably accounted for about 10% of the Black Panthers activities. And then they did something else. They went into Chinatown in San Francisco and they helped what's called the Red Guard, which was a group of working class Chinese Americans who were trying to stand up to police brutality. They helped them organize the Little Red Guards. They then went to the fields in, in Southern California and they helped organize the Brown Berets. They went to the Native American reservations and they helped organize the American Indian movement. So there was a lot of organizing going on Ever since Mao took China from the Kuomintang and Khrushchev had the Soviet Union, the United States of America has been trying to tell the world a big lie. Hey, black people are doing just fine here. We love them. They're great. They're happy. They never said that through World War II. They never said that through World War I. They said, black people know your place, okay, at the bottom under my boot. But when 
the world began to shift. Then they said, if we do not put on a good happy face of being good democratic people where there is no racism, then Mao and Khrushchev will capitalize on that and the entire world of black people in Africa and the United States will look to the Soviet Union and look to China for support and that will cause dissension and problems internally. Since the 1950s, it can no longer feel comfortable saying, yeah, we're a white country, so what? It had to stop that. And when the cell phone came about, and anybody can take a picture of the cops, okay, then the real image of the United States began to become mediatized and purported and sent all over the world through social media. And so the United States began to freak out because its image of what it really is was being portrayed in rapid deployment on TikTok, on Snapchat, on Facebook. And so this then caused a lot of people in the West, in Western Europe, for example, to say, whoa, you know, what's going on there? And then, and, and young black people who um, may have experienced a bit of a lull in this also began to rise up we, and we got Black Lives Matter. One of the ideas that has motivated Afro-pessimism comes out of a book called Slavery and Social Death. I won't go through all of it, it's a very long book, but I'm gonna oversimplify this argument. He makes an argument and he says, anytime you have a civilized society, um, which is to say a society that is not simply people who have no tribal hierarchy and people who are like hunter-gatherers, they, in other words, what I'm trying to say is that a society that is not agriculturally based and a society that is not industrially based, and that's almost, there's almost no society like that in the world anymore, okay? But you get these concepts that come out of these societies, right? And so there's going to be class divisions, there are going to be gender divisions, but you also get another kind of division. And that's a division between those who have the right to be part of society and those who do not have the right to be part of society. And he makes a very provocative uh, argument and claim in this book. And he says, if you, do, if you have a stratified or civilized society and you do not have either present in the body form or in the mind, some kind of figure who is not an absolute outsider. If you don't have some kind of figure who is not an absolute outsider, someone who has no right to have rights, someone who um, has no consent to be violated, um, someone who not, is not necessarily in chains, but cannot be recognized as a member of a community. If you do not have some figure that is completely outside of community, that you can point to and say, hey, that figure can never be part of community. Then what happens to the people who are community, who are part of the society, they begin to wonder who they are. What is their identity? How can you know what the word freedom means if you cannot point to the word slavery? Simple terms, but hopefully not simplistic terms, is that he's arguing that slavery has always been a necessary component of any so-called civilized society. And he says it doesn't have to be people in chains chopping cotton. The Ming Dynasty had slaves and they did not chop cotton, but they were civil servants, they wore robes, but they were understood to be absolute outsiders, people whose lives were possessed by everyone else and yet they wore very nice garments and worked in the civil service of the Ming Dynasty. And the, the shorter part too is that something very interesting began to happen in 625 AD, and I don't know how to talk about it, but somehow the Arabs, the people who would later be called Iranians, even people who would later be called Chinese, people who would later be called Iraqis, uh, people who would later be called, uh, who would be called Moroccan Jews, somehow from 625 AD, they all 
began to think of Africa as a place where there were complete outsiders, and they began to treat Africa as a place of slaves. And that's a really interesting um, origination story, because before that moment, there were no Black people. There were no Africans. They were Maasai, Ugandans, Swana, Shona. In other words, they had tribal identities, but the word Black comes out of the lexicon or the archive, the set of books and writings, mainly by Arab scholars and Arab slave traders, and so does the word Africa. That's how, but the first part is why, because every organized world needs a body to point to that cannot be part of that world, and Blackness became that 1,300 years ago.